Hello and welcome to the Miko Bits show and I am your host Miko Bits. Today we have an exciting show for you. We have Tegan Klein who is heading up the business development and investor relations functions at the Graph Protocol and we're going to learn a lot more about what that is. Uh, she has a, a great fintech background having worked at a lot of uh, fintech giants like uh, Merrill Lynch and Bank of America, as well as Barclays, uh, and, and also has been working uh, on a bunch of pretty important blockchain projects, uh, IPWI and uh, ORCID, and now the Graph Protocol. So, um, you know, I think I have an exciting show for you. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, just this video program is opinion and information and entertainment only. It's not intended to be investment advice. So just a quick disclaimer here. Before we start, if you're interested in Bitcoin and blockchain, please consider clicking that subscribe button and also click the bell so you can get notifications about future videos that I might post. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's great. So uh, can you tell me, uh, first of all, like, how did you get involved in blockchain? Sure. Yeah. So I was working on the sales and trading floor at Barclays and had always been, you know, enjoyed the work at, in banking, but always felt kind of lost in that space. And I learned about Bitcoin actually back in 2011, tried to buy some, it was too difficult. Um, and actually my friend just launched Avalanche Protocol that was teaching me about Bitcoin back in the day. Um, but when I really saw the opportunity, it was when I learned about Ethereum and I saw the opportunity to basically disrupt finance. And I think that that's kind of what we're doing now. Um, so four years later, here we are. And I, we have, I think we have a lot, a long way to still go. Oh, wow, that's very exciting. So uh, tell me, uh, what is the graph? Sure. The graph is an indexing and query protocol that is powering many applications in uh, Web3 and, and really DeFi today. So what does that mean? So index, you can kind of think of a database. And then query, you can kind of think of search. So what Google does for search, the graph is doing for blockchains. Um, and you can kind of think of it like an open API, an open layer uh, of data on top of blockchains. That's kind of where the graph sits. And then applications sit on top of the graph and then their UX and UI improves when using the graph. Um, yeah, and so the graph is really working to make data more accessible, especially, you know, Ethereum and IPFS data currently. Yeah, that's exciting. And it's, uh, you know, I think one of the great things that, you know, I think you're known in the industry for, uh, other than uh, currently being the leader of uh, Crypto Underground uh, as well, is that, you know, you, you, you work on projects that have quite a lot of kind of uh, software delivery, you know, and I think that's that's really, I think, great to, that you're working on these very credible projects. So, you know, I, I think one thing that'd be great for you to share is like, who is using the graph uh, and, you know, what what is the community like? Yeah, so the graph is actually one of the most used protocols in the space currently. Uh, we've kind of found product market fit, which is sometimes rare for, for blockchain companies. So the graph is used, it has a huge community of developers. Um, and so currently over 2000 subgraphs have been created by thousands of developers. Uh, applications like uh, Aragon, uh, DAOStack, Synthetics, Aave, Gnosis, Numerai, Live Peer. Um, Gods Unchained, many different applications. So all throughout kind of the Web3 ecosystem. And we've been growing really quickly. So we hit 1 billion queries in June, and then we did 1.7 billion queries in July. So growing at about 50% month over month. Wow. So, uh, you know, I, I guess there's some pretty reputable and, you know, for example, DeFi projects like Balancer and Synthetic and Aave, you know, I guess I'm curious, uh, you know, Uniswap, uh, I'm curious kind of what what those DeFi projects are doing. Like, you know, what are, they, what are they getting out of this query and these capabilities? Yeah, so we're powering a lot of exchanges. So when you use the Uniswap exchange or the Synthetics exchange, that's all powered by the graph. So before the graph, it was really difficult to pull data from blockchains. It would take forever, and there and that's why this narrative came that there weren't many users. 
But now, you know, with the graph where, where we've iterated to, um, you can use the graph and, and pull data very quickly um, and efficiently from blockchains. And we're saving developers about 12 months worth of code. That's why so many of them really enjoy using the graph because we're saving them so much time. And it just makes building on blockchain so much easier. We use GraphQL and that link or that GraphQL is very widely known within the Web2 space. And so it's, it makes it easy for Web2 developers to kind of come in and start building on blockchains. So are the exchanges kind of using it for their own sort of internal analytics and metrics? Like, is that, is that the application or how, do, how you know, what, what's, what kind of applications? Yeah, so anything, any kind of data that you need to pull from Ethereum, you can pull into your application. So if I want to understand like the price of, if I want to understand how many trades went through between X price and Y price during some period of time, the easiest way to do that is to pull that using the graph. I see. Uh, so, so has DeFi increased uh, usage of the graph? It has, yes. Actually, DeFi broke the graph for a moment. Wow. Um, <laughs> so yield farming came and uh, we thought we were prepared and um, a lot of uh, DeFi um, activity came onto the graph. We're currently seeing about 80% of the network is, is by, via DeFi. Um, and so we had this postmortem, you can read all about it, but I think it was really in that moment when people realized how reliant they were on the graph. And the graph is currently hosting the network. Um, so the goal has always been to launch a decentralized network. And we'll be launching that later this year. But for right now, we're hosting the network. And anytime you're relying on a single point of failure, that single point of failure, you can't have constant uptime. And so, you know, we, we believe and we are striving to this decentralized network, not because we want, not, not just for fun, um, not just to kind of toot our own horn, but because it's very important to have serverless applications that have constant uptime. So that if one node goes down, there are many other nodes on the network to um, be up and running. And so yeah. it's exciting. It, yeah. It, yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, it, obviously, these, uh, you know, really important DeFi services are relying on on the graph. And, you know, obviously, as as the traffic starts to go really hardcore, you know, I think all of this kind of scalability uh, stuff matters a lot. Uh, is, so is is like, uh you know, is is the graph running like on a blockchain or is it running in a more traditional way? The graph is on, so we're at ERC-20 token, uh, our, our token's ERC-20 token, yeah. and we integrated with Ethereum and IPFS, so really using Ethereum smart contracts um, and, and likely expanding to other layer ones later this year. We are kind of blockchain agnostic and we do want to provide an open data layer on top of all blockchains. That's interesting. And what what other blockchains, you know, have have been interesting for you guys? Yeah, we've been talking to all the top layer ones. Um, really, wherever the developers go, we hope to be. Uh, but no, no announcements as of yet. Oh, OK, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, you know, what are what are some of your personal favorite uh, DeFi projects? Uh, you know, the, I just yeah. want to talk about DeFi just for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, at first, I think we should say, you know, like, what is DeFi? And DeFi, if I had to simplify it into one word, I would say DeFi is credit. And the reason that DeFi is important, I know it's all the hype right now, but the reason it's important is because um, to date, like finance is, is relatively out of, out of touch or out of reach to most individuals. Um, it's, it's really kind of for, for businesses, um, you know, for, for people who have large, uh, able to trade like large algos, um, and so what decentralized finance is doing, it's bringing the power back to the individual so that the individual can transact in this decentralized finance space. And so that's why I'm, I'm excited about DeFi personally, um, coming from traditional finance and just seeing um, this opportunity to kind of the power going back to the, the people is exciting for me. Um, the, my favorite products, I mean, there's so many. I really like Aave, I really like synthetics. Um, one inch is interesting. Um, they just yeah. got. Uh, they just announced new financing. Uh, yes. One, one inch did. That's that is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm glad you you talked about uh, Ave because you know I did interview uh, Stani for this show and uh, and Synthetics as well. Uh, I'm gonna have. Uh, 
you know the the CEO joining my show as well. So I'm excited to to have those be top picks for you. Uh, it sounds like we should get one inch on here as well. Yes, yeah, you should. If you need an introduction, let me know. Yeah, I I like that. You're definitely one of the very well connected people in the space. So I I really always appreciate your help. Uh, so uh, I think uh, you know for for me. Um, I'm interested in in getting some of your reflections since you, I think, began your career. If I if I'm not mistaken, in the traditional world of kind of uh, centralized finance, right? So with with some of these uh, banking, large banking institutions, you know. So I guess what I'm kind of wondering is sort of how you sort of take some of those experiences into you know this this DeFi oriented world. Yeah, I mean, coming from traditional finance, it. it I think one thing that I would like to see is a more, it, I, want, I want to see it become more easy to trade um, for, for the individual. I think right now the space, the DeFi space is very fragmented. Um, and I think that a lot of the UI is fragmented. And so I think in the future, I kind of envision something a little bit more like Bloomberg, um, where you can kind of do a one-stop shop for trading. And I think that that is relatively simple to create in the DeFi space, it just hasn't been done as of yet. Um, and I also find the example of Bloomberg interesting because Bloomberg's worth what, like $25 billion and why? Because they have proprietary information that they make people pay for. And so with the graph, we're, we're opening up information that is fully open. Um, and you know, some people would like to see us kind of bottle up that information and sell that in more of a SaaS business model. But because we believe in decentralization, we've taken on the route of the token as being the business model and not charging for open source software. Um, and I think that's really important. And so I think it's like just democratizing the access to information and data. I really appreciate that uh, ethos because in a way that is part of what has inspired this program, which is that what I think happened with the advent of Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin blockchain is that he essentially created an open uh, ops layer, right? Which is that any anyone who kind of has basic nerd skills can download a binary of the Bitcoin blockchain and run a node, right? And, and it really isn't that hard. Like, you know, running a node isn't that hard. Like, uh, you know, being a core contributor to the Bitcoin source code and all that is hard, right? Like, that's exceedingly hard. Uh, but, um, the the you know just running a node isn't that hard and and so there's open ops right which is i think new right like they, there's no open source project i mean obviously there's projects where people voluntarily run uh nodes but they're mostly only running self-serving nodes right and i think the reason why like if, for example one one example could be like email servers right so people run email servers and like yeah they kind of do it in a self-serving way but those email servers kind of push things in and out of your company, right? So mm -hmm. that's why they run them, right? They don't run them on behalf of the entire internet, you know, and it feels like what's happened is, is that since these nodes print money, right? It enables this completely new model, right? Which is beautiful. And all of that is kind of the underpinnings for DAO, right? Which is this idea that these things can be like floated out into the world and they can be self-perpetuating. But I don't, I don't want to rant too hard. Uh, but I just wanted to say that, you know, that Satoshi also contributed open data, right? Which is the whole blockchain principle. So to me, like that ethos about sharing information is really that, you know, a lot of people find this stuff intimidating and obscure. And, you know, I just think it's important to have these kinds of discussions, you know, in a kind of more public way so that people can feel included and they can learn whatever they want to learn and take away. Yeah, and on that, I mean, it is an entirely new business model. Tokens are a new business model. And I think it's, it's, it's funny to think about, or at least it's funny to kind of watch people get kind of start to grasp that. Um, I think that, you know, SaaS took a while for people to grasp as a new business model and tokens are an even more steep learning curve. Um, but I mean, Salesforce dominated that SaaS business model and they're worth what, like $177 billion today. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to more and more people and, and tokens are allowing for open source development, right? Before this, I mean, it's really difficult to get funding if you're in the open source space. And I think that the tokens as a business model is, is the way to do that. 
Um, that is yeah. exciting. I think there's a lot of innovation that can be made in sort of using cryptographic tokens for kind of funding projects, right? Because what I mean by innovations is I think it could be structured a lot better. Like for, mm -hmm. let me, uh, uh, one example is this, right? Which is if you take all the Bitcoin core developers, right? They should all be like crazily rich, right? They should, right? Uh, and it turns out that like some are and some aren't, you know, and, and, and it's kind of random which ones are. I mean, I won't say random, but like the ones that just happen to be interested in mining themselves or, you know, the people like that, right? And mining themselves at scale as opposed to, because how else would you get them, right? It wasn't like, oh, you know, Satoshi, like I'm going to work on the core code. So can you give me Bitcoins for free? I think that only happened to like three people, right? Like there, there weren't that many people that Satoshi basically sent Bitcoins to and he didn't send that many. So I guess what I'm really saying is, is like, you know, it's not equitable. So, you know, I, I feel like things like Tezos with this kind of invoice pull request model or there's, there's people innovating here. And I just feel like, you know, if you think about startup equity, like that's a model that at least is really structured and says like, you worked hard on this for a really long time. Like, here's your piece of the pie. I don't know. How do you feel about like solving the problems of funding projects? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that tokens are a good way to do it. Um, I just, I, I think that they've gotten kind of a bad rap because of what we saw, the greed that we saw in, in 2017 and, and beyond. Um, but I think that there are a lot of really great people doing really great things in this space that aren't doing it for the money. Uh, they're doing it to really change the world and actually be able to kind of redistribute resources um, so that people have, you know, so the playing field is a little bit more more even and so that more people have opportunities so the graph we did like a passion project called everest which is kind of you could think of it like a, a linkedin for all of the applications within the, the this blockchain is distinct this is distinct from the blockchain with that name am, am i correct correct yeah it's it's an entirely new project it's basically an application and we created that just to kind of make the space less fragmented. You know, a lot of people say there are no users, there are no users in Ethereum, but there are, you know, that's kind of an old narr narrative, just like, you know, Ethereum can't scale or won't scale. Uh, I think that's a little bit of an old narrative. Um, and so it's exciting to be able to go in there and just see the different, not asset, asset classes, but the different use cases and be able to kind of identify what you're passionate about and then go and see who's building on that. And I think that that will open up a lot more opportunities for more people to young people to be able to identify their passions early on and be able to like go into a career field that they're actually passionate about. You know, it took me until I found crypto to understand what I was passionate about. I was kind of lost in this finance space, um, always looking for my passion, but it was difficult to find. Um, and I think that's just because I didn't have the tools to understand what all the like unlimited possibilities of things that you can do with your career. Um, and so I think the sooner we get those possibilities to young people, the, er the earlier we get them to young people, the better. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's happening with respect to kind of the whole crypto blockchain space is that there really is a bit of a generational element to it, you know? And I think that one of the things that has become fairly clear is that, you know, these kind of emerging hybrid Neo bank players like uh, Cash App, I think, are really taking over with respect to providing traditional banking services to younger people, right? So, you know, you see Robin Hood or you see Cash App, you see Revolut, you know, I think PayPal is getting into the Bitcoin game. So it feels like these hybrid Bitcoin and traditional uh, things are, are starting to be the interfaces. Totally. Yeah, I'm laughing because I just remember at Barclays, we, we grew so fast, Barclays, and we were just kind of, everyone was just throwing technology onto each other. And it was like this Lego stack that I was always felt like I was going to tumble over. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is common within a lot of these banks. And so they're so large that it's difficult to go in and, and fix that technology. And I think that that opens up a lot of opportunity for smaller options like Robinhood, like N26. Um, to really go in and dominate, you know, especially with Corona, that was kind of like a black swan event uh, where everything went digital. And then a lot of people didn't have access to their old banking mechanisms. So yeah, it's interesting to see the shakeup. But yeah, I, th I think yeah. that the surveys, uh, sorry, uh, the, I think the surveys are showing that the trust in 
kind of traditional banks is is kind of at an all time low. Yeah, I mean, and it's all kind of the on ramp to crypto. I think it'll ultimately end up in you know in real crypto, right? Decentralized, open source, permissionless. Uh, projects. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's exciting. So, uh, with respect to the graph, uh, you know, I, I is there this is not investment advice, but is there a token that you know people can buy? There will be. There is not one now. Um, so the graph is a work token model, and so there's a few different sides of the network. So there are the indexers, which are relatively technical individuals who um, operate nodes. And we just launched our task net a, a week ago, a little over a week ago. And so we've started to distribute out our network and invite other node operators to come and start spinning up nodes. And we've seen a tremendous number of nodes come in to register for that, which I'm pleasantly surprised. And they're global. So there are nodes all over the world that are signing up for our um, to be indexers on the network. But those indexers, they stake GRT tokens um, on subgraphs that are spun up by developers and then curators, which are semi-technical individuals in the network as well. They signal on which subgraphs are the right ones to, for the indexers to index on. So for example, you spin up a Miko subgraph and I spin up a Miko subgraph. Well, obviously the curators are going to say your subgraph is better than mine. And so then the indexers will notice to stake on yours as opposed to mine. And that happens on a bonding curve. So the earlier they signal, the more they earn. Um, and then there's also delegators. So if you're not technical, you can still stake, um, you can delegate your stake to the node operators, the indexers, and, and split that stake. And then on the other side of that is the um, applications and the developers uh, and the users that are querying the blockchains. Got it. Got it. Okay. And uh, tell me kind of like, uh, you know, I, I understand that you, you launched your test net. So like, you know, when, when is the main net expected? Yeah, so we're launching later this year, um, and we're really looking forward to that. So we anticipate that the, the test net will last about three months, um, and then we should be ready to launch the main net. What's exciting about this test net is that our code has been running in production for about 18 months. And so um, actually next week is the first, very first phase of our test net where we're going to unveil that to all the indexers. Um, and there's actually an opportunity to still register. If anyone's listening to this and a node operator, we welcome you. Um, and so we're testing the economics now. Um, and so, yeah, really, really looking forward to seeing how it all goes. And how, and how, does, how does the token economics, how, how does the, that work? Yeah, so I guess as blockchains begin to uh, transact with trillions of dollars, um, people and developers and users will... Uh, will query blockchains, you know, trillions of times a day. And so that is captured within the, the ecosystem. And so um, the, the indexers that stake uh, earn those rewards um, from the folks that pay to query the blockchains. And you can kind of think of that similar to like gas costs on Ethereum. And so the users can either pay for that or the applications where the users are coming from can choose to take on that expense on behalf of their users. Got it. And so, uh, so when you do mainnet, uh, you're imagining that there will be sort of uh, members of the public who are token holders, and that they're going to be going after like staking. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's a work token model, so you kind of have to do work in order to earn the token, um, and you know you have to actually use the network in order to kind of be a participant in the network and a token holder. I see. So it's not it's not just kind of like securing the network, right? Because one of the things that people do is, you know, in, in traditional staking is that the the stake is used to secure the network, and there's this kind of this, uh, you know, that's considered to be, a, you know, this this sort of liquidity yeah. or value. Yeah, it's a little bit different. So it, the data is kind of verified by those indexers that I mentioned, and then when the indexers choose to index a subgraph. They verify the on-chain data, and then they query, and then they process the queries for that data. Um, and so they're staking against the indexes to ensure that they're they're getting accurate data. Um, and if they're not, then they're they're slashed. I see. And uh, how do how do you kind of balance the kind of 
value equation, right? Because obviously the more valuable the data is, right, the more there should probably be put at stake, right? Because the penalty for lying about something big, it should be bigger than the penalty for lying about something small, right? Absolutely. How does that work? Do you, do you have a mechanism? I would have to ask Brandon Ramirez on our research team and yeah. I can. I'll get back to you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, it's mostly just curiosity. I'm really trying to like figure this out. And, uh, you know, I think from from my perspective, you know, it's, it's do you have kind of a plan further uh, to be a public token or uh, like a token introduction? Um, and that will be to, and we'll be optimizing for distribution. So we want to have a very uh, decentralized and distributed uh, network at, at our launch. Um, and that's very important important to us. Yeah, it makes sense. And our, your, your, uh, I think you mentioned uh, that it would be uh, ERC twenty based. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's that sounds meaningful. So I guess the bigger questions become sort of where does this go? Like, what is the future? Yeah, I mean, I I think that blockchain is the is the future of the internet. Um, I think that you know developers are already moving with their feet. They'll continue to move with their feet to kind of open source data that information will grow to be open. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I see the future going. Yeah, and what about what about specifically for the graph? Obviously you've outlined the plans to kind of go to a mainnet and you've outlined kind of the plans to fully decentralize and operate kind of a, a tokenized, you know, decentralized set of nodes. You know, but are, are there other additional? You, I think you also mentioned kind of new, as yet unannounced blockchain partnerships. So I think those are all you know exciting. But like you know, just just curious if if yeah. you can kind of and, and you know, I'm not asking you to pre-announce anything. It's more just uh, kind of the far farther future, more speculative kind of you know what what's yeah, what's think, in your dreams. I think the graph will become this open data layer on top of all blockchains, which will basically become the web. Nice. And and just to clarify, right, the graph is really very much focused on kind of uh, replication of on-chain data. And the graph doesn't address like off-chain data, you know, uh, things like Oracle data or kind of database type data. Well, it's interesting that you asked that because today, so we announced a partnership with Chainlink a little while ago. And today was actually the day that the first Chainlink subgraph was created um by a member of the community actually they spun up that subgraph and so all chain link data all chain link oracle data can now be indexed and um, queried by the graph so the graph is doing more on-chain data whereas chain link does off-chain data the graph doesn't really touch oracles other than with that partnership with uh, chain link but now any oracle data can be indexed and queried by the graph that's interesting. I mean, I think it's clear that uh, Chainlink has quite a bit of sort of leadership in Oracle-based adoption. But, you know, do you guys envision, you know, there being more such partnerships in the future? Absolutely, yeah. So we also just announced a partnership with Scale, which is another layer two. I yep. think kind of as a lot of these layer ones kind of come to fruition, a lot of the hype kind of dies down. The next focus is really on that middle layer of the stack to make sure what we're building in this space is better than what is, you know, already exists in the centralized space. Um, and any layer two can essentially partner with the graph to have that data and that um, information queried, queryable. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess the thing that becomes kind of potentially, you know, novel and pot potentially complicated, right, which is that once you start indexing kind of data from uh, the perspective of, of uh, you know, something like a chain link, then, then, you know, what about, so so if the data is incorrect, are you just going to rely on the kind of mechanism within chain link? You know, are you going to kind of trust their data or, or are you planning to kind of come up with your own uh, Yeah, we're, we're not really yeah, I mean, the Oracle problem is, is a big problem. Um, the indexers are kind of in charge of confirming that data, um, but the graph in and of itself isn't solving the Oracle problem. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's the thing that pops up as soon as you move from kind of like uh, on-chain data into the off-chain data world. Uh, so uh, any, here's a question is, you know, what are, what are some unusual or novel applications that you either have uh, people using today or that you envision? 
Yeah. So another announcement that actually came out today is that um, any, so a member of the community created a subgraph for any um, non-fungible token. So any ERC-721 can now be queried via the graph. So any digital art is now fully tracked on the graph. Any collectible asset um, piece of art on the blockchain is now, you know, it's no longer fragmented. Um, and so, you know, we've seen, a, we've seen a lot of people request this. So a lot of people request this because they have this inventory of NFTs and they want to be able to aggregate that data and they haven't been able to do that. And so literally today, um, someone created this. For wow, us. that's kind of <laughs> fascinating. And it's the implications are really interesting. Uh, you know, my fund, Gumi Crypto's Capital, invested in OpenSea, which is sort of like a catalog of non-fungible tokens. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think it, it, that would be a potentially interesting you know, uh, partner, because I think one of the things you talked about is sort of how uh, DEXs, DeFi exchanges, et cetera, are, are prodigious users, right? So it, it seems like it would make sense that an NFT exchange would be like a user of your data capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, the NFT space is, it, it, it's definitely heating up. I think that there's a lot more to do, a lot more progress to be made. Yeah. Uh, so, so tell me how, uh, like, um, what's, what's your, uh, kind of what, what gets you excited about, uh, you know, this, this project and then also kind of blockchain in general, I think you mentioned kind of the movement of yourself from the financial services, you know, and then, and then, you know, just the discovery of Ethereum, you know, so I, you know, I guess, obviously programmable money to some extent, but, you know, I, I'd really love to kind of get your big picture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with Bitcoin, you know, you have, you're able to transact peer to peer, you're able to own your money without asking a government, a corporation, any middleman, if you can send money. And then Ethereum kind of exploded that into every single asset class. Um, it's really just about giving the power back to the individual. Uh, I think with the graph specifically, I'm really excited about being able to provide open data, not having a bunch of proprietary information, kind of democratizing access to information, um, and also not having kind of a central point of failure for these applications to be able to build on and kind of le leveling the playing field. I think, you know, monopolies have really exploited and kind of abused their power and and now it's time for some competition. So we're bringing the competition um, and we're kind of disrupting that power and giving it back to the people that have kind of been stripped of so much. Yeah, I think one of the things that emerges when you talk to folks that are blockchain powered is really that, uh, you know, there is a feeling that absolute power corrupts absolutely, absolutely. right? And so this feeling that, you know, if you amass too much power in a centrality, you know, then you're going to see, you know, corruption and malfeasance and you're going to see people doing, you know, things. And I, I think one of the things that's emerged uh, out of this is kind of like the cancel culture, you know, which is which is a way of, you know, a distributed or decentralized population, you know, holding people accountable. Right. I mean, in a sense, one of the complexities of it is that the people who are you know, shouting at each other on social media themselves are not really accountable, you know, so that's potentially a problem, right? People can say whatever they want and sometimes it's not true, you know, which is troublesome. But I guess, I guess to me, you know, if you think about this as a social dynamic, you know, I think that it, it is part of like recognizing the trend towards decentralization. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. Uh, any other uh, thoughts or advice or thoughts that you want to contribute? I don't think so. The things are such a great show. Yeah, absolutely. Really enjoyed having you. And, uh, you know, if you have other announcements or interesting topics to discuss, uh, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much, Miko. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>